Today is day two for the Come Follow Me readings for this week, April 24th through the 30th, John 7 through 10, I am the Good Shepherd. Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, John 8. Chapters 8 through 10 of John represent a period in the Savior's ministry when opposition from Jewish leaders was intensifying. In response to an effort to trap him in his words, the Savior showed compassion in refusing to condemn a woman taken in adultery. <clears throat> the Adulterous Woman John 8, 1-11 And Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst of the people, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses is now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? As the Savior was teaching in the temple, scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman who had been taken in adultery. They asked Jesus if she should be stoned, as commanded in the law of Moses. Elder Bruce and McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained their motive when they asked him this question. In bringing the adulteress to Jesus, the scribes and Pharisees were laying this trap for the master. One, if he agreed with Moses that she should be stoned, he would both a arouse the ire of the people generally by seeing, seeming to advocate the reinstitution of a penalty which did not have popular support, and b round, run counter to the prevailing civil law by prescribing what Rome prohibited, and two, if he disagreed with Moses and advocated anything less than death by stoning, he would be accused of perverting the law and of advocating disrespect of and departure from the hallowed practices of the past. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convinced by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst of the temple. When Jesus had raised up himself, and saw none of her accusers, and the woman standing, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And the woman glorified God from that hour and believed on his name. Sister Amy A. Wright said, Christ's response to the precious daughter of God was, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Another way to say go and sin no more could be go forth and change. The Savior was inviting her to repent, to change her behavior, her associations, the way she felt about herself, her heart. Because of Christ, our decision to go forth and change <clears throat> can also allow us to go forth and heal, for he is the source of healing all that is broken in our lives. Christ sanctifies and restores broken relationships, most important our relationship with God. Referring to the Savior's statement, Neither do I condemn thee, President Dallin H. Jokes of the First Presidency taught, In, the conte in this context, the word condemned apparently refers to the final judgment. President Oaks further explained that Jesus did not condone the woman's sin. But he was allowing her time to repent and acknowledging that her final judgment would come later. The Lord obviously did not justify the woman's sin. He simply told her that he did not condemn her, that is, he would not pass final judgment on her at that time. This interpretation is confirmed by what he then said to the Pharisees, Ye judge after the flesh, 
I judge no man. The woman taketh an, taken in adultery was granted time to repent, time that would have been denied to those who wanted to stone her. <clears throat> President Spencer W. Kimball similarly taught about the Savior's words to the woman. His command to her was, Go and sin no more. He was directing the sinful woman to go her way, abandon her evil life, commit no more sin, transform her life. He was saying, Go, woman, and start your repentance. And he was indicating to her the, the beginning step to abandon her transgressions. The Joseph Smith translation makes clear that the adulterous woman did follow the Savior's counsel and reform her life. And the woman glorified God from that hour and believed on his name. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. For whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, taken in adultery in the very act now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned but what sayest thou What sayest thou? He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Jesus. Has no man condemned thee? When speaking about the Savior's interaction with the woman taken in adultery, Elder D Dale G. Renlund said, Surely the Savior did not condone adultery, but he also did not condone, condemn the woman. He encouraged her to reform her life. 
She was motivated to change because of his compassion and mercy. The Joseph Smith translation of the Bible attests to her resultant discipleship. And the woman glorified God from that hour and believed on his name. How are we blessed by the Savior's mercy? Speaking of the Savior's desire for us to keep trying when we make mistakes. Elder Lynn G. Robbins of the Seventy taught, while we are grateful for second chances following mistakes or failures of the mind, we stand all amazed at the Savior's grace in giving us second chances in overcoming sin or failures of the heart. No one is more on our side than the Savior. To become like him will require countless second chances in our day-to-day -day struggles with the natural man, such as controlling appetites, learning patience and forgiveness, overcoming slothfulness, and avoiding sins of omission, just to name a few. I am eternally grateful for the loving kindness, patience, and long-suffering of Heavenly Parents and the Savior, who allow us countless second chances on our journey back to their presence. When have you felt like the woman receiving mercy instead of condemn condemnation from the Savior? When have you been like the scribes and Pharisees, accusing or judging others even when you are not without sin? What else can you learn from the way the Savior interacted with the scribes and Pharisees and the woman caught in adultery? What do you learn about the Savior's forgiveness as you read these verses? The Light of the World we can often appreciate truth more clearly by seeing its opposite. The Savior brought greater understanding about his divinity and mission by using contrasting images, such as light versus darkness. Early in the morning of the next day after the feast, which would have been the Sabbath, the Savior again returned to the temple. As he taught near where the large golden candelabras uh, stood during the feast, he declared, I am the light of the world. It is Jesus Christ who gives light to all. John eight twelve through 36 Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light, the light of life. Light was used as an important symbol during the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Savior used this symbol to call the people to believe in him as the Messiah. On the Temple Mount... Four large golden candelabras, also called menorahs or candlesticks, illuminated the temple grounds during dances and other festivities, held late into the night and early morning. The golden candelabras, which were 50 cubits tall, which is approximately 73 feet, or 22.25 meters, not only provided light for the celebrations, but they symbolized that Israel was to be a light to those who walked in darkness. The Savior continued his teaching in the temple by declaring, I am the light of the world. President Dallin H. Oaks identified three ways in which Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the light of the world because he is the source of the light which proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. Jesus Christ is also the light of the world because his example and his teachings illuminate the path we should walk to return to his presence, to the presence of our Father in heaven. Jesus Christ is also the light of the world because his power persuades us to do good. The celebration known as the Feast of Tabernacles was marked by a brilliant display of light which emanated from great golden candlesticks set up within the temple complex. Jesus apparently took advantage of the situ situation to declare, I am the light of the world. This is Elder Bruce R. McConkie. His hearers will well knew that their Messiah should stand as a light to all men. That is, they knew that he, as the very source of light and truth, would stand forth as a light, an example, a dispenser of truth. They knew that his, that his would be the mission to mark the course and light the way which all men should travel. Messianic pro prophecies given to their fathers promised that he would be a light to the Gentiles, a light piercing the darkness of error and unbelief, 
Jesus's application of these prophecies to his own person was a clear proclamation of his own messiahship and was so understood by his hearers. Sister Virginia U. Jensen said, We can all find ourselves in places of darkness from time to time. We may wander into dark spiritual caverns when we make foolish choices, admit harmful influences into our lives, or turn away from the light of the gospel to embrace the world just for a little longer. It may seem harmless at first, just a little exploring, that's all. Before we know it, we become separated from the light and left in darkness alone. Why do we remain in darkness when such rescuing light awaits us? Let us bask in the warm and illuminating light provided by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let the Savior's kindly light lead us one step at a time. Let covenants and commandments keep us safe as we follow the gospel pathway to our heavenly home. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. The Pharisees challenged the Savior's testimony that he was the light of the world by stating that he that they did not have to accept the witness of one person who bore record of himself. Jesus responded by appealing to the law of witnesses contained in the law of Moses, with which they were very familiar. In this instance, the law of, Mo the law of witnesses was satisfied by the two beings whose testimonies were irrefutable, the Father and the Son. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I came, and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury, as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then Jesus said again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. The Savior has repeatedly told his followers that those who believe in him will eventually join him in his Father's kingdom. While the Savior invites all to come unto him and eventually be where he is, some will decline the invitation and die in their sins, meaning that, meaning they will not repent and be made clean through the atonement. The Savior's statement, Whither I go, ye cannot come, applies to those who understand the invitation and the opportunity to accept the Savior but decline. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, That ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Jesus Christ is the only one to ever live on this earth who could accurately say, The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Perhaps that is why he spake not as other men, neither could he be taught for he needed not that any man should teach him. He not only refrained from sin, but he actively did what pleased God. For more insight in, on the Savior's perfection and his sinless life, see Hebrews 4.15, For he hath not an high priest 
which cannot be t uh, cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And First Peter two twenty one through twenty two, and then I added twenty three. For ever, for even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did not, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Doctrine and Covenants twenty twenty two. He suffered temptations, but gave no heed unto them. And then the commentary for Hebrews seven twenty six. Paul explained that Jesus Christ can save us because he lived a perfect life. Elder Bruce D. Porter of the Seventy explained how the undefiled and perfect life of Jesus Christ was crucial to his atonement. The trial of Christ, the trial of Jesus in Gethsemane, would not have been possible, and could not have occurred, had it not been preceded by faith, by a lifetime of sinless virtue. From his temptation in the wilderness to his rejection in Nazareth to the illegal trial. Before the Sanhedrin, Christ paid the price of a perfect life, walking in holy sinlessness, despite adversity, physical suffering, deep sorrows, and the snares of ruthless and determined ad adversaries, both seen and unseen. He suffered temptations, but gave no heed unto them. All this he did with the knowledge that one misstep would mean creation's doom. For had he sinned, even in the smallest point or slightest negligence of thought, the atonement would have become impossible and the whole purpose of creation frustrated. The burden of the whole world weighed upon him through every moment of his life. We can often appreciate truth more clearly by seeing its opposite. The Savior brought greater understanding about his divinity and mission by using contrasting images such as freedom versus bondage to sin. Then said Jesus to them, to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. As the Savior taught important truths about his mission as the Messiah, many believed on him. He taught these believers that if they continued to obey his word, they would know the truth, and the truth would make them free. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency taught that continued obedience to the Lord's to the Lord leads to knowledge of the truth and to freedom. Obedience leads to true freedom. The more we obey revealed truth, the more we become liberated. Freedom and liberty are precious gifts that come to us when we are obedient to the laws of God and the whisperings of the Spirit. Obedience to principles of revealed truth makes us truly free to reach the potential and the glory which our Heavenly Father has in store for us. Elder Bruce R. McConkie identified some ways in which the truth shall make you free. These ways include being free from the damning power of false doctrine, free from the bondage of appetite and lust, free from the shackles of sin, free from every evil and corrupt influence and from every restraining and curtailing power, free to go on to the unlimited freedom enjoyed in its fullness only by exalted beings. Elder Jack and Gerard said, In the world today, the debate over truth has reached a fever pitch, with all sides clamoring truth as if it were a relative concept open to individual interpretation. In April conference, President Nelson taught, If we are to have any hope of sifting through the myriad of voices and the philosophies of men that attack truth, we must learn to receive revelation. As we step back from the world and assess our lives, now is the time to consider what changes we need to make. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Some of the Jews who believed in Jesus Christ's teaching seemed astonished by his assertion that following 
the truths he taught would result in freedom, they declared that they were never to, in bondage to any man. They had never been in spiritual bondage to any nation because they were the seed of Abraham. They were, in essence, asking how could, how they could possibly be enslaved spiritually with this pedigree. Jesus then taught, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. The Greek verb translated as committeth implies continuing in, in sin rather than a single occurrence of sin. While discussing the use of addictive drugs, President Russell M. Nelson described a pattern of enslavement that can inhabit, inhibit the full use of our agency, a pattern that can also result from continuing in other kinds of sin. From an initial experiment through uh, thought to be trivial, a vicious cycle may follow. From trial comes a habit. From habit comes dependence. From dependence comes addiction. Its grasp is so gradual. Enslaving shackles of habit are too small to be sensed until they are too strong to be broken. Agency or the power to choose was ours as spirit children of our Creator before the world was. It is a gift from God nearly as precious as life itself. Often, however, agency is misunderstood. While we are free to choose, once we have made those choices, we are tied to the consequences of those choices. For more insight on the effects of continuing in sin, see the commentary for 1 John 3, 6-9. The King James Version of 1 John 3, 6 reads, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, or Christ, neither known him, the Joseph Smith translation of 1 John 3, 6, 8 through 9 clarifies the difference between one who sins and one who continues in sin. Whosoever continueth in sin hath not seen him, neither known him. He that continueth in sin is of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not continue in sin, for the Spirit of God remaineth in him, and he cannot continue in sin because he is born of God, having received that Holy Spirit of promise. John also contrasted those who choose to continue in sin with those who abide in Christ. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. As the Savior taught using the metaphor of a vine and branches, he emphasized that we are to abide in him, using the word abide repeatedly in John 15, 1-10. To help us understand the concept of being taught by the Savior, the concept being taught by the Savior, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland explained, Abide in me is an understandable and a beautiful enough concept in the elegant English of the King James Bible, but abide is not a word we use much anymore. So I gained even more appreciation for this admonition from the Lord when I was introduced to the translation of this passage in another language. In another language, in Spanish, that familiar phrase is rendered "permanence in me," like in English, like the English verb "abide." "Permanencer" means to remain, to stay. But even English speakers like me can hear the root co cognate there of permanence. The sense of this, then, is stay, but stay forever. That is the call of the gospel message to everyone in the world. Come, but come to remain. Come with conviction and endurance. Come permanently, for your sake and the sake of all the generations who must follow you. Jesus said, Without me, ye can do nothing. I testify that that is God's truth. Christ is everything to us, and we are to abide in him.
permanently, unyieldingly, steadfastly, forever. For the fruit of the gospel in, to blossom and bless our lives, we must be firmly attached to him, the Savior of us all, and to this, his church, which bears his holy name. He is the, he is the vine that is our true source of strength and the only source of eternal life. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and a man, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so sh have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. As recorded in John 15.10, <clears throat> Jesus promised his disciples that if they kept his commandments, they would abide in his love. In our day, the Lord has given a similar promise. Be faithful and diligent in keeping the commandments of God, and I will encircle thee in the arms of my love. Some people may feel that because God has much great, such great love for his children, it should not matter whether they keep the commandments. They feel that God's love will excuse them from obeying his laws. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency explained that God loves all his children, and his universal love bestows many gifts on all of them. But we must keep God's commandments in order to receive God's choices blessings. God's love is so perfect that he lovingly requires us to obey his commandments because he knows that only through obedience to his laws can we become perfect as he is. God's choices blessings are clearly contingent upon obedience to God's laws and commandments. The key teaching is from modern revelation. There is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundations of this world, upon which all blessings are predicated. And when we obtain an, any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. If a person understands the teachings of Jesus, he or she cannot reasonably conclude that our loving Heavenly Father or His Divine Son believes that their love supersedes their commandments. <clears throat> These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. The Savior then declared that a servant, a servant of sin, remains in a house only if the owner so desires. But a son, especially the son, has a rightful place and abideth forever. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Through his atonement, Jesus Christ extends that rightful place to each of his followers and makes them free indeed, free from humankind's greatest enemies, which are physical and spiritual death. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What does it mean to be a servant of sin? See Moroni 7.11 For behold, a bitter fountain cannot bring forth good fruit, neither can a good fountain bring forth bitter water. Wherefore, a man being a servant of the devil cannot follow Christ, and if he follow Christ, he cannot be a servant of the devil. What truths taught by Jesus can make us free? John eight thirty seven through 58 I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. When the Jewish leaders boasted that they were Abraham's seed, implying that they held special privileges in the sight of God, the Savior reproved them for failing to do the works of their highly esteemed ancestral father. They were not acting like the covenant children of Abraham. Rather, they were trying to kill the God of Abraham, who was standing before them and telling them the truth. The book of Genesis records some of Abraham's works that stand in contrast to the behavior of the Jewish leaders. 
Abraham converted others to the gospel. He avoided strife. He was obedient to God. He welcomed heavenly messengers. He exercised tremendous faith. We can often appreciate truth more clearly by seeing its opposite. The Savior brought greater understanding about his divinity and mission by using contrasting images, such as truth versus error. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. The Savior reproved the Jewish leaders for their actions by declaring, Ye do the deeds of your father. He was clearly implying that the Jews were serving someone other than God. In apparent retaliation, bristling at the suggestion that they were, the, they were sons or followers of the devil, the Jewish leader said, We be not born of fornication, which was an insult about what was thought to be Jesus' illegitimate birth because Mary and Joseph were not legally married at the time of Mary's conception. This insult helps us understand the kind of treatment Jesus may have endured throughout his life. In many ways, he knew what it was like to have people revile him, persecute him, and say all manner of evil against him falsely. Okay, John eight forty two. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. The Savior proclaimed to the Jewish leaders that if they believed in God, they would love him, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot bear my word? They refused to believe in Christ because the God they worshipped was the devil, who is a murderer, a liar, and the father of all in truth. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye be believe me not. Which ye, which of you convinceth me of sin? And, and if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? The Joseph Smith translation states that <clears throat> he that is of God receiveth God's words. Ye therefore receive them not, because ye are not of God. <clears throat> the response of the Jewish leaders was to call Jesus a Samaritan, the lowest of all people, and not of Jewish descent, and state that he was possessed of a devil. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? These leaders had hardened their hearts, refusing to believe that Jesus was the Son of God, even through, even though their father Abraham, all other ancient prophets and their scriptures taught them, taught, taught clearly of him. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me, and I seek not mine own glory. There is no, there is no, there is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. When Jesus declared himself to be the God of Abraham, it incited such an ire among his opponents that they took up stones to kill him. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep thy, my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead, whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I shall say I know him not, 
I shall be a liar unto you, like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. What did Jesus mean, Before Abraham was, I am? Elder Bruce Summer Conkey said, This is a blunt and, point, and pointed an affirmation of divinity as any person has or could make. Before Abraham was, I Jehovah. That is, I am God Almighty, the great I am. I am the self-existent, eternal one. I am the God of your fathers. My name is I am that I am. To Moses, the Lord Jehovah had appeared, identified himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and said, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Of a later manifestation, the King James Version has deity say, <clears throat> I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. From Latter-day Revelation, we know that one of the Lord's great pronouncements to Abraham was, I am the Lord thy God. My name is Jehovah. And accordingly, we find the inspired version of account reading, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. I am the Lord God Almighty, the Lord Jehovah, and was not my name known unto them? That the Jews understood Jesus plainly, <clears throat> Jesus' plainly state, stated claim to Messiahship is evident that is evident from their belligerent attempt to stone him. Death by stoning being the penalty of blasphemy, a crime of which our Lord would have been guilty, had not his assertions, assertions as to divinity been true. But Jesus evidently exercised divine powers, past unknown out of their mist. When the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush, he used the name I am to identify himself as the God of Israel. When the Savior said to the Jews before Abraham was, I am, he was referring to himself by this same title. By using this name, he declared to the Jews that he was Jehovah, the same being who spoke to Moses from the burning bush and who has communed with prophets in all, all ages, including in our dispensation. Jesus told the Jews that Abraham had seen his day and been glad. One occasion when this may have occurred is when Abraham saw Jesus Christ on a mountain before he was born. Christ was crucified on the mount of Golgotha, making himself an offering in place of all of us, just as a ram was offered in place of Isaac. John recorded a number of occasions when Jesus declared, I am. The following chart the following chart provides some of the Savior's significant I am statements found in the Gospel of John. John 6, 35, 48, and 51, I am the bread of life. <clears throat> Jesus Christ gave himself for us in the atonement. He feeds us spiritually. John 8, 12, and John 9, 5. I am the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the source of all truth. If we follow his words and example, we will not stumble or walk in spiritual darkness. John 8, 58. Before Abraham was I am. Jesus Christ is Jehovah of the Old Testament. John 10, 7 and 9. I am the door of the sheep. Jesus Christ protects us like a shepherd at the door of a sheep enclosure. <clears throat> no one can enter his kingdom except through him. John 10, 11, and 14, I am the good shepherd. Jesus Christ leads us. He gave his life for us. He knows each of us individually. John 10, 36, I am the son of God. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the Father's spirit, Father's spirit children and his only begotten in the flesh. <clears throat> John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, we can overcome physical and spiritual death. Jesus Christ gave us the gift of resurrection. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father, and he is the source of all truth. Because of his atonement, we will all be resurrected and through our faithfulness may inherit eternal life. John 15, 1 and 5. I am the true vine. We depend on Jesus Christ for life. Only by abiding by his teachings will we be able to bear the fruit of, of righteousness. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone. But I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Where is thy Father? Ye neither know me nor my Father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. <laughs> Who art thou? Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, do always those things that please him. And if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. Why can ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death.
Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And hast thou seen Abraham? Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. John eight fifty nine. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. The Jews Jesus spoke to obviously understood what he was saying, that he was God, for they sought to stone him. They believed him, believed that his claims were blasphemous, and this was the prescribed penalty for blasphemy according to the Mosaic law. <laughs> 